Okay, this is the tech check for tonight's live recorded session. If you're in here, I see some of you are in here. Just let me know if you can hear me. Um, I guess I, I only have three minutes to fix it if there's a problem, but uh, that's better than nothing. So if you're here, tell me, tell me who you are, what you do. And if you're watching this on replay, we are going to begin here in about two and a half minutes or so. Hi, Jeremy. Hey, Brother John. All right, Laura. Laura, my, my daughter's name is Laura, my second daughter. Uh, Brad. Amazing to see you, Brad. Cambodia. Jamie, hey there. Yes, again, if you're watching live, don't worry. This is not the regularly scheduled programming. If you're watching on replay, don't worry. We're going to we're gonna get to it, but I always jump on a couple minutes early. Jamie from Arkansas. Arkansas City. So, Jamie, did we meet? Your picture is so small, but um, I came to Arkansas City some time ago. Back when, when people traveled for PD, Barb, hey, Barb, good to see you, Washington. Zach, Zach from Rockford, my friend. Okay, great, Jamie. Yeah, I wish I could see your picture bigger because I, I'm sure I would recognize you. But, yep, what what was that? Uh, what was that? Arkalala or something? Some kind of big festival was happening that time that I was visiting, and it was – that was pretty neat. Jeremy teaching vocational English in Turner Falls, Mass. So good to have all these colleagues here tonight. We're going to have a good time this evening. We're going to encourage one another. It's going to be good. All right. I've, I've, I guess I should make sure that my, my uh, screen sharing is good. Okay, so how do I do that again? Yeah, this is the stuff that you really should, uh, you know, should, should check. But it's okay, right? I mean, we still have at least 30 seconds. At least 30 seconds. Hi, Aika. Good to see you. Uh, okay. Chrome tab. How's that work? That works. That's what I like. Okay. Okay. That's looking good. Okay. Another few seconds and we're going to start. I see some people have put things in the question. That's question box. It's great. Jane from Sparta down the road. Oh, West Michigan is representing tonight. Denise from Valdez, Alaska. Denise, I have a student who started with us last week, first week of remote learning, she started with us and she's from uh, Kodiak. So I was looking at pictures of where she's from and I was just kind of, my jaw was just kind of dropped down. Social studies, Northern Colorado. Oh, this is so cool. So cool. Oh, Diana, yeah, waiting for the bottom to drop out. It sounds like that's gonna, that's gonna be a pretty severe change for you when it comes. Pam. Hey, Pam. Oh, so good. So good, everybody. Well, I'm showing nine o'clock, so we had better, uh, in the words of my old college roommate, we'd better, we'd better kick this pig. Okay. Uh, don't let me forget to put those slides back because I've done that before. Uh, so, um, hi, Please, please allow me to, to say, uh, you know, thank you so much for being here tonight. I've got 10 or so things ready to share with you that are helping me as a very experienced remote teacher. <laughs> uh, I've been doing it now for about a week and a half. Uh, obviously, we all did it back in the spring. And uh, so, so many fun things. So, yeah, I see, I see that some of you are sharing where you're from, what you do. I love that. Please do that. Um, also, since we are going to shoot for a heavily encouraging vibe uh, while we're here, share, share a bright spot from your week so far too. And if you're watching live, 
you can see all of this stuff happening on the, well, if you're on a computer, it's on the right side of your screen. It's set up a little differently if you're on like a, a tablet or a phone. Um, if you're not watching live, I'm just going to try to narrate everything that I that I uh, say and do so that you can have a good listening experience after the fact, good viewing experience after the fact. These webinars can work really nice for um, department meetings or PD. And uh, I'll, I'll share with you, you're, you're totally free to, to do that, to share these. Um, Obviously, if you if you feel so moved, you can give a little extra to support the cause. I do want to say, oh, I love all these introductions. <laughs> Bright spot from Amanda Adams. Her homeroom kids did an impromptu recorder concert. One kid found one of his recorder and nine others found theirs too. That is awesome. But <laughs> that's amazing. Pam, that is a bright spot too, teaching in person still. That's great. That's great. Oh, and I know some of you have been doing this all year long, so you probably are about to put a clinic on for me. Um, okay, so uh, I, I thought about titling this session So Many Cats because I've never I've never seen so many cats in my teaching career. And truly uh Truly did not expect all the cats I would get to know. In one of my classes, we named a cat, named the cat Genghis Khan. That was a warm-up activity one day. I try not to make my class all about cats, but, you know, some days it's a little difficult when they are just the only people who are on screen. <laughs> uh, thank you again for coming tonight. You have blessed my family and I with your generosity, and I don't take it for granted. These are the beautiful people who live in my home, some of whom, who knows, could be making a, you know, celebrity guest appearances. We'll just have to see. We, we, we try to, as a family, all uh, really focus during these two hours when we do these webinars. Um, some of us focusing on being in our beds and like sleeping. Others focused on giving webinars, but we'll see. We might switch roles. <laughs> um, I'm a high school teacher. If you're not familiar with my work, I've been doing this now since 2006. I've taught sixth grade all the way through 12th grade, mostly English language arts, but for the last handful of years, um, a lot of social studies this year, all social studies. I teach ninth grade world history in a team taught setting. And I teach uh, ninth grade AP world history. So I've got just under 100 kids this year. COVID has affected a lot of things like teacher scheduling. So I'm not quite on a full load. And then I write. I write a lot about teaching and learning. And you should check out the blog if you never have. Lots of all kinds of words on that thing. And my key question is, how do we, how do, we do this work really well without driving ourselves insane or our loved ones? So we've got kind of three headings in this session, just like the last session that I did. If you didn't catch that, that was 10 or so things that are helping right now. And that really focused on uh, my work as a concurrent teacher. But this time we're going to we're going to look at my work as a as a remote teacher. So I think I've covered a lot of the logistics. But again, if you want to share this with a group, please do. Uh, any added giving is super welcome. If this makes you feel overwhelmed, it could do that. I'm going to share a lot of things with you. My objective is to be as useful to you as possible. And if you have to listen to this in 20-minute chunks over the next handful of days, that's awesome. That's great. So long as I provide you with lots of good things to think about, um, perspectives on things that may enrich yours, deepen yours, challenge yours, um, solidify yours because you realize you really like how you're doing it versus how I'm doing it, all those things are on the table, and I do pray that they'll happen. Um, if you are here live, totally participate, though. I see uh, a, a good amount of you doing that. Use the chat. The chat's so fun. Use the question box. I will go right up to the two-hour limit. So if you're with me on Eastern time, you're going to be like, is this guy going to go to bed ever? And you're with me on Pacific, you're going to be like, oh, he kind of designed that whole thing just around my my life because now it's 8 o'clock, and uh, I'm – I'm, I'm ready to go, you know, enjoy a nice book before bed. <laughs> Us Eastern time people are going to be like, holy cow, I'm tired. Uh, th there's other things that I've made that 
could be useful to you that also support my work, my book, these six things, student motivation course. I do trainings for schools. Love for you to reach out if you think I can help. And let me just start with the first thing. Let's start with Mr. Fred Rogers himself. He's been on my mind a lot these days. He's the first remote teacher a little bit. Um, obviously, his context is really different. His television neighbors, um, uh, did, <laughs> they never, they never, you know, talked back to him. Uh, he was only ever staring at blank screens. Uh, and, and, you know, actually just, just a little, a little camera is, is all that they ever looked at, but, but he did a lot of things that I've been thinking about. And, uh, a couple of reasons that Mr. Rogers has come to mind. First of all, it, the only DVD that we have in our van, our van has one of those DVD players, but the only one that we have in there is, a, a couple of Mr. Rogers DVDs. So, um, you know, it's my, my kids will sometimes beg to watch Mr. Rogers on a long drive. And so I get to listen to him teach. And I've also been enjoying this book, or I, I guess I, I did enjoy this one Saturday. I was doing a lot of work outside and um, I think Ryan Holiday, he has a cool reading list that he, that he emails out. Um, he emails out the, the books that he read each month. And he mentioned this one, Spiritual, The Simple Faith of Mr. Rogers. And I just, I just really appreciated it. Um, I, I appreciated understanding a little bit more what, what makes him tick. So uh, he has this sort of kind of famous plaque hanging up in his office. Um, it's from The Little Prince. And it translates to what is essential is invisible to the eye. And I think that's so important as we consider the many confounding variables. I mean, every day I'm overwhelmed by how much complexity there is with, with our job always, but especially during remote teaching. So I, I like to come back to this line of Mr. Rogers. By the way, can anyone take their shoes off better than this guy and like put their other shoes on anybody? while singing? No, nobody can. That's the answer. Um, these are just some some lines from, from Fred Rogers that I've appreciated. Sorry, this will be my textiest slide. Uh, textiest, not sexiest, okay? I, I, I wouldn't say that it's that. Um, here's a line. Hurriedness causes a child's soul to become hard and resistant, Fred Rogers thought. Taking time and going slow is nourishing. Sometimes I feel this intense need to do everything so fast, fast with my students, fast with myself. Rogers uh, said, for me, being quiet and slow is being myself. That's my gift. What, it, what I like about this line is that Fred Rogers was never trying to be what people said that he should be as a remote instructor. He was just trying to be who he was. And I think that my generation especially and people younger than me we can take authenticity like too far in my opinion and become hyper narcissistic i don't get the sense that fred rogers would like was like that at all but he was really interested in not pretending unless you're trying to pretend you know so the land of make-believe awesome pretending to be something that you're not not awesome I think this is what he means when he says that one of the greatest gifts we can give anybody is one more honest adult. And then this is just the best because Fred, Fred Rogers did everything wrong from the perspective of being a, a television show, everything wrong. I mean, the, no special effects, no whiz bang, super repetitive program, the same old blocks of learning every time. He'd mix them around, play around with them. I mean, no one did the things that he did on his show better, but but he wasn't doing the things that you were supposed to do. He wasn't doing the trendy things. He wasn't constantly reinventing the wheel. He just was doing a super simple thing again and again. It's amazing to watch his show. Um, and I love too that, that he didn't, spend all his time on TV studying TV. The guy, when he, when he had leisure opportunities, he would read, which is good food for my thinking because sometimes I feel like I've got to, I've got to, uh, you know, read all the latest and greatest about remote learning. And that's, that's not, that's not really true. 
So I just want to ground us in some Fred, and now let's talk about instruction. Okay, let's go, Stuart. Give us some meat and potatoes, man. All right. So last time I shared an instructional model that I was using. I'm going to quickly retouch it in case you weren't there last time. Um, and, and I want to talk about how it transitioned. Okay, so what we were doing is concurrent teaching. There's really no such thing as in-person teaching this school year. I, I've, I have found that to be true. I've heard that from many people because even when we were in person, there were always any number of students on any given day who were uh, quarantining or isolating or absent or whatever. So you had to provide an adequate learning experience for absent students while also teaching in-person students. That's what Catlin Tucker means by concurrent teaching. So on November 5th, we got the news that that was over for us at our high school and that the following Monday, so that was a Thursday, the following Monday we were, no, I'm sorry, that was a Friday. Um, the following Monday we, we were going to be starting remote teaching, which was, uh, you know, something that we had been ready for, been told like, hey, that this is what we're doing. We'd spent time in August getting ready for this, but but here it was, Okay. And the model that we were switching to is basically a school schedule, but slightly abbreviated. So classes went down from 60 minutes at the high school per class down to now they're 45 minutes. And the intention was that you're going to spend about half of that time synchronous uh, with, the, with your whole class and about half of that time uh, supporting individuals or small groups. All right. That, that's, that's the model that our school went with. Okay. So, how has it worked? What I was doing before we shifted to remote, how how has that shifted to remote teaching? Um, so, so, so here's what I was doing. I was doing what Catlin Tucker calls the playlist model, okay? Mine was not sophisticated. Catlin Tucker is a blended learning guru. She's been writing about this way before um, it was hyper profitable to do so. Okay. She's, she's been invested in this for a long time. Her work is excellent, but it's heavily sophisticated way beyond my pay grade as a blended teacher right now or a remote teacher or, or what have you. But I like this idea of a playlist that students would work through semi-autonomously. And so I started to mess around with a super basic version of that. Um, Whenever I'm thinking about instruction, I'm trying to filter it through a one sentence encapsulation of my work. I call this an Everest sentence. So if you've been reading for a while, you're familiar with this. Uh, chapter one of my book is all about the Everest sentence and what we get from focusing our work. This year I made a change to my Everest sentence and I really focused on knowledge building. Did so much thinking about equitable outcomes this summer, um, partly because of what was going on in the world, partly because of just a growing conviction that my research really, my research and my work in the classroom started to really clash in this idea of some students really, by the time they get to high school, there, there's a major, there's a major gap and it's really difficult for students on the wrong side of that. Um, and I just started to realize that a knowledge rich learning experience k-12 can can fix that so you can see here on this on the screen that right right now this school year we're all about growing in our knowledge of world history knowledge of ourselves and knowledge of life and long-term flourishing so the top is my job that's what i'm paid by my school this year to do that's my task nobody else is tasked with teaching my students world history nobody so that's really important to have at the top. But then along the way, partly because I want to make my class a, a motivating learning experience for my students, and partly because I think world history is most useful to us when it when when learning about it becomes a way to to mature ourselves. I, I also like these pieces that that talk about ourselves and life and long-term flourishing. So the question is for, I mean, really whatever sentence allows you to do is plug your ears and ignore a lot of the fads, ignore a lot of the buzzwords. Everything that you're doing is filtering through that sentence. And if it's a good sentence that has some academic rock in it and some whole student stuff in it too, after all they are, they are whole people. I always, 
you know, it, it, it kind of gives me a kick when people talk about teaching the whole child because you're always teaching the whole child. It's just whether or not you're doing that intelligently and verbally and effectively is, is another question. Uh, I, I want to filter all these things through my Everest sentence. OK, and that's really all that these six things is about. These six things is my, I guess you could say, treatise on why I'm OK with being amateur, with being very, very average, if not below average in almost every area of teaching, except I want to be as good as I can possibly be at cultivating the five key beliefs beneath student motivation. We'll look at that a little bit today. Providing a knowledge rich curriculum, a generous feast for my students. Okay, that's the second thing. Giving my students ample opportunities for what I call earnest and amicable arguments. So arguments that are really trying hard to get to the bottom of an issue, but to maintain the friendship with other people all the while those arguments aren't common in our in the United States right now. And I'm trying to do those three things through lessons that look like lots of reading, writing and speaking and listening experiences. Okay. So this in practice, I'm, I'm going to come back to the election. Okay. I, I won't forget that, but, but we're kind of on a roll here. I don't want to lose this thread. In practice, this means if, if you look at my class, you're really just going to see two to four learning blocks per class, per class period. This is what I was doing, doing during concurrent teaching. This is, this is what I'm doing now during remote teaching. A block is just a simple reading, writing, speaking, listening combo, not all those things, but usually two, that is targeting um, motivation and or knowledge building and or argument that's specific to my discipline, my, my assigned um, teaching responsibility. So this year, world history. Okay. Now that all sounds really theory rich. So let me, let me just speak to a couple of examples. If you're watching this, you're seeing tons of words on the slide. This is one of those things I'd recommend that you access the slides that I'm going to send to you or uh, pause the video. So if you're listening and you want to check out these blocks learning more, take a look at the slideshow later on because I'm not going to read through all these. But for example, um, a block, a, a, a lesson could look like um, block one. Almost every single day, I think every single day, there's a warm up for my students. This is what we do right at the start of class. And I ask them to respond to something in writing. They may respond to some writing prompts. That those, those may lean open-ended. They may be personal. They may have to do with learning strategy. Very often they're about content that we recently learned or trying to activate and engage for content today. Um, some type of writing is what they're going to do. Um, typically the next block is we're going to, as a whole class, discuss some of these pieces of writing that students have submitted. While we're in remote teaching, I've really liked being able to put up on the screen for all of us an anonymized examples of what students submit for their warm up. So I just I set my screen up to only share a, a little rectangle and then I hover that right over a piece of student writing. And I'll, and I'll just I'll, I'll comment on the writing or I ask students, you know, agree or disagree and give reasons, that type of a thing. So block one, you're writing independently in response to a couple of prompts or stimuli. Block two, some type of whole class discussion about what we just did, about where we're going to go. That's going to end with some direct instruction about what we're doing for the rest of our time. And then those final two blocks, one or two blocks are going to be independent activities that my students are now going to do in their own little individual Zoom room. And I'm going to be using that independent time to support students who are struggling or create moments of genuine connection with my students. And I'll talk more about that a bit later. This block concept is really important to me not going crazy. It's been a, a, a big game changer. So I, I just want to, like I, I thought about taking a picture of it today, but I have this index card sitting next to my computer at work and it was, it's kind of old. I should probably throw it away, but um, it was just my early brainstorm of, okay, what are the rep repeatable blocks 
that I can use again and again because I was reinventing the wheel all the time, trying to make everything new. And really, I just needed to gain some experience, give my students some experience with, with a handful of different learning blocks. Okay. Um, do if 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 I'm saying anything, my folks who are live, where you're like, hey, go go a little more on that. Feel free to throw it in the throw it in the chat, and I'll try to check. Like I'm I'm looking right now. Looks like we're good. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep jamming. Then I'm gonna keep jamming. Okay, so so here's a visual of that. Um, it, it's it's not complicated. This is really what my class normally looks like. Um, you've, you've got, you've got three to four blocks in, in a class period, but with concurrent teaching, I had to find a way to make those blocks accessible, whether or not you were present or absent. And now with remote teaching, I've just had to figure out how to make those blocks accessible when you're all absent physically and most of you are present remotely and some of you aren't. <laughs> that, and that, that's why it has to be so simple and repetitive. So, um, you know, by the way, Rogers was the man with the, these repeatable blocks of learning. He had the opening song, does a little monologue. Somebody comes knocking on the door, usually Mr. McFeely, all right, with a speedy delivery. Maybe he's got something to watch in picture picture and he goes and does visits with neighbors. He's got some make believe time, but the guy was just using a bunch of repetitive blocks and he's a great example of why that does not have to be soul sucking or deadening. Does it? Because you don't build a legacy like this guy did having just a terrible soul sucking deadening show. I mean, Mr. Rogers probably is the most impactful children's programmer in the history of television, at least impactful in a way that I think you and I want to be. It's crazy in that book that I shared earlier, The Simple Faith of Mr. Rogers, he'd get these letters from people about how like he saved their life doing some lesson, <laughs> like they're overhearing him playing for their kids and, and it made all the difference to him. So we're gonna get to that tonight. Why, like what is it about that? Why is it that in our profession, people are obsessed with the format. They're obsessed with the technique. Well, Rogers showed that, you know, your format, and your technique, you, you want to be good at these, but there's something deeper that you're really after. And we're going to look at that because I, I think, I think that's why a lot of our, a lot of our, uh, a lot of, a lot of low fluff approaches work. Is, is because there's something else there. And of course, a lot of them don't because there's not anything else there. So the application on this point would just be, what are your top five to 10 favorite learning blocks? Think in terms of simplicity, sustainability, okay? If it's a learning block that takes you an hour to plan for, well, if you're teaching more than one prep, that's gonna get in trouble really fast. That's going to be a tough block to produce on a regular basis. You don't have time. Not if you're going to be giving students feedback. Not if you're going to be growing your expertise. Not if you're going to be like, what do they call it again? Oh, sleeping. Yeah, yeah, sleeping. That's right. I've heard that's important. Um, so to answer the first question, and then I'll, I'll loop back to the politics, because really the approach is, is very similar. Um the instructional model that I shared in, in episode four of these webinars this year, that it's the same one that I'm using in remote teaching and it transitioned really well. It was almost like my students and I were preparing for remote teaching all year once, I, I mean, like I said, at the beginning of the year, I was I was kind of reinventing the wheel, but we, we've, we've been preparing for this for, for quite a while. And I think that if we hadn't been, I could still probably shift to this model. Okay, so before we get into Zoom, because because really Zoom Zoom is its own uh, bag of worms, let's let's really quick talk about let, let's talk about politics because I said that I would. Um, and and my brother John is here who gave me the book that has helped me so much. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just give credit to our friend J R R 
from Colorado for, for giving me a book that helped me. Uh, so, so there's two parts of this, of, of teaching the election, two things that I found challenging. One is um, ju just the instructional considerations. If I want my students to engage in earnest and amicable discussion and conversation and argument around something as <laughs> explosive as American politics in 2020, um, there's, there, there's a ton that, that has to just go into the considering about the instruction. But then there's also heart stuff too, right? Because I, I get I get charged up just like the next person um, by this or that type of political stimuli, and and I have to catch myself from thinking that that you know I've got the edge on on uh, reality, and everyone else is just kind of a knucklehead. So the book that really helped with my internal work is called The Three Languages of Politics. The Three Languages of Politics. John, throw in the chat who wrote that book because I cannot remember. And I only have it on Kindle. But uh, that book is so good at humanizing the, the three ways that people often talk about politics in the United States. That helped me with the internal work so that I could come to this issue when it came up in my class with kind of a full and balanced heart. But then really think about this, okay? This is how I approach teaching something like the election. I want to make sure that I'm cultivating the five key beliefs beneath student motivation all the time, okay? One of the best ways to make a student no longer think that you're credible is to offend them. So there is a certain degree of care if you want to be a credible teacher that you have to take when talking about an emotionally charged topic. You've got to be mindful of offending students because there is a cost to that, a pedagogical cost. It's one of the worst things that you can do for your credibility. The second thing on this list is so important because so much of our political discourse is jacked up in the United States right now because we live, I, I guess we, we kind of segregate into knowledge light or knowledge skewed environments. Social media creates its own bubble. Our friends are very often of the same political persuasions as us. And then, you know, pick your, pick your media source. A lot of times you're going to see some type of bias there. So I never try to teach my students that they can't trust anything. I tell them there is such a thing as being too skeptical, right? Um, if I if I sit here and and I'm skeptical that uh, you know I'm I'm talking to you through a computer, and if I, I I'm like okay, but am I really talking to you through a computer? Is there something else going on here? It would be very silly, right? Waste of time, Dave. Think about something else to be skeptical about. Well, yeah, that's just right. I want my ninth graders to understand you want to be skeptical to the to the point of where it's useful. And the way to do that is to build lots of knowledge. So in short, in touching on the election this fall, I would provide my students with some articles of the week every now and then that, uh, for example, one that laid out the policies of uh, candidate Biden, one that laid out the policies of candidate Trump, one that talked about the um, the projected voting uh, turnout, how high it was going to be, one that talked about the Electoral College. Once in a while, we would touch on other things, like uh, we'd look at some clips from the presidential debates. And a lot of this is happening in the context of a warm-up, because I'm not teaching a political science class or a current events class, but I do want to help my students to see the way that knowledge building is important with current events, just as it is with world history. Okay. I'm happy to answer more specific questions about that, but the big thing that you should do is get the little book, the three languages of politics by Arnold Kling. Thanks, John. The three languages of politics is so good. Like you're going to love, I, I think, I hope, it's going to enable you to love the next time you get to talk to somebody who really sees politics differently from you because you're going to try out this thing called a, a intellectual Turing test where uh, you're going to try to speak to them in a language that they, that they are thinking about issues in. And it's going to be fun.
It's gonna be fun, okay? <laughs> it's gonna just. I hope. I hope it's gonna be fun. I mean, I can't think of too many political conversations I've had in the last year that have been fun. But what will this say? It's gonna be fun. Okay, let's talk about Zoom. Let's talk about Zoom. So. The only thing that was difficult about shifting to remote learning in terms of my instructional model was Zoom, because Zoom is really different. That's a brand new context. And as a result, I needed to teach and reinforce norms in Zoom on the first day of class. Even though I had been with these students for nine weeks, I knew that I was going to have to treat it a little bit like, so there's an interesting balance. On the one hand, I don't want to make a huge drama deal out of this for my students. They, they don't need one more person in their life hyping up all of the changes that they're going through. So, so I want to present a little bit of a calm presence when they're with me, but I also do want, want to indicate we're, we're going to have to be thinking about remote learning differently than we are in person learning. So I want to establish norms. Okay. Norms are useful to a teacher because they allow students to not think about behavior so much and to think instead about academics, to think about the things you want them to be good at. You don't want the key result of your class to just be that students got good at behaving with one another in a productive way. You don't want that to be the primary outcome of your class unless you're teaching like preschool or kindergarten. And then those are those are those are good like Everest type aims. I mean, get some academics in there, but but those are excellent. But if you're teaching anything above that, you you want to achieve academic outcomes so that your students have as many options in their life as possible and they can experience the many things that knowledge opens up. Norms are how you do that. When you can establish norms and reinforce norms, then your students are going to not have to think about behavior as much. You're not going to have to think about behavior as much and you can instead focus on instruction. But how do you do that? <laughs> it's nice to say, but how do you do it? So I think about it in terms of a bunch of really quick little drafts, okay? Or maybe maybe I should have called these blocks. Not really. These are learning blocks on our first day of class and little moves that I'm doing inside of them to teach and reinforce norms, all right? So first day of Zoom classroom, we're all together. Hey guys, it's so good to see you. Oh my gosh, I missed you. Great to see you, great to see you. Uh, by the way, a little context, before our school rent went remote, I was out of school for 10 instructional days because I, I was required to quarantine. So I, I like haven't seen my students in person in a month. So it really was good to see them on Zoom at least. So, so I'm telling them that I'm saying, okay, I want you to get right to your warm up today, just like we normally do in class. You'll see that I made a little video for you. Take a look at that video. It's about five minutes long and then respond to these written questions. I'm going to go ahead and set a timer on screen for 10 minutes. You see that timer now. All right, go ahead and start the video and then answer the prompts. So I'm saying that. OK. And by the way, while I'm doing that, I'm 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 modeling the norm that we're going to get right to it. We're going to be nice to each other. Say hi, smile, say hi to all the cats, all the cats, lots of cats. Got to say quick hello to them, but then let's go. Let's get some writing and thinking going on. All right. And what I'm having my students do here, sorry, that, that link is cut off, but that link comes up later is I'm having them watch this little video that I whipped together. I just, it, it kind of struck me on my one day of prep for remote learning. Um, I'm going to do five tips, five tips for my students on how to learn remotely and enjoy their life too. That's how I'm going to frame remote learning. I'm going to frame it as, hey, we might as well view this as an opportunity to potentially do school a little more efficiently. And then what types of things can you use that extra time for? What types of things could you explore? Could you do? Could you practice? Could you research? Um, what, what fun could you have? Right. So, so I framed it like that. They're ninth graders. They're very interested in freedom. Um, freedom from adults like me. <laughs> so, so I go through these tips. You can watch this video if you want. It's on my YouTube channel. I'll, I'll give you a link um, in, in a little bit. There's, there's another slide that has the link. And then after they watch this video where I walk through five tips, then they click reply. 
And I want them to be processing, reflecting, applying goal setting about those tips that I just gave. Okay. Those tips really are just a way to get them thinking strategically about remote learning because that's a norm. I don't want my students going through the motions in school. I want them to becoming intelligent learners, people who learn on purpose, people who are growing in their understanding of how learning works and how to do it most effectively, because I, I, I think that's incredibly powerful. Okay. That second draft, they're writing about what, about those tips that I gave them. Draft three, now we're doing a whole class conversation after the warm up. As soon as that warm up timer goes off, I tell my students, hey guys, when, when we're done with warmups, I'm going to call on some of you randomly, just like when we're in class. It's not like a getcha. It's not, I'm not trying to catch you. I'm just trying to hear from all of you. I want all of you to be heard by all of us at least once per week. So they can kind of see me with my clipboard and they know I'm going to call on all of them at least once during this post warmup whole class conversation time. And, and so that's kind of implicitly establishing a norm or connecting to a norm we already had. All right, so now we're, we're talking about, we're elaborating a little bit on what different people have contributed. Next up, I'm going back to direct instruction real briefly. I'm trying to connect some threads to things that we've established in my class. So for example, if you look up skull and crossbones list, Dave Stewart, you can Google that skull and crossbones list, Dave Stewart. You'll see this, this concept that I use to make my students just, um, practice their best writing habits versus, you know, do you ever, do you ever get students who don't capitalize things properly and they clearly have known how to do that since, you know, second or third grade, but they just don't do it because they've learned that they don't have to. The Skull and Crossbones list is about that. You can again, read about that on the internet or in my book and the writing chapter. So I'm, I'm working through those types of things. Really quick hits. Want to give them an idea of how we're going to run our class. Um, but I'm not trying to spend a ton of time here because I'm also trying to establish the norm of I respect you. You're intelligent. And I know that you get this. So um, let me just quickly touch on it. Now, some of my students don't get it or don't want to get it. And they're going to push back. So, for example, one of my norms is. Don't engage in distracting behaviors because you're inhibiting everyone else's ability to learn. So I don't want silly faces on Zoom. I don't want you flashing Zoom on and off, your, your video on and off. I, you know, um, and, and I get that we all make mistakes, so I'm going to gently remind you and then we'll go from there. But like I, I don't – you can't do that stuff in my class. And that's what I've got to reinforce. So we'll talk about that next, what I did with a kid who misbehaved. Um, pretty, pretty significantly on the first day, but just take a look. All that we're doing in trying to establish norms, all I'm trying to do, all I'm, all I'm trying to do is touch on this really the same idea a bunch of different ways through listening, writing, speaking, listening, and then a bunch of little pretty low effort by me reinforcement. Okay, that's it. That's it. I've heard other colleagues over the years. I, I sometimes hear colleagues frame norms like. Um, you know, they, they go straight to consequence, straight to consequence. This is what will happen if you don't do it. Consequences aren't bad, but, but you don't want to make consequences the number one reason why you don't want to break a norm. You want to frame it a little more like, like it's good. It's just, it's just life's a lot easier when you don't, you know, make faces on Zoom. It's just going to be a little better. And we teach them, teach them, teach them, teach them, teach them, right? We don't assume that they that they know all these things that they that they can do all these things. Um, just taking a look here at the chat. So Amanda, they answer my warm up in in the it's called an announcement in Canvas. They just click reply uh, right on the announcement. That's where the whole lesson is is kind of presented in a daily announcement. They click reply and then they just answer right there. So that way I've got a permanent record of it. I think Google Classroom, you can do something like that, I think, and probably the other platforms. I don't know. Uh, Matt saying, do you, do you ever offer policy perspectives anonymously rather than attribute to one of the candidates or were they always identified? Matt, I'm going to throw that in the question box um, because I'm 
because I want to, I want to loop back to that when we're back to that. Uh, sorry that I missed that one when we were, when we were at it. Uh, Amanda, it might be like an update in Schoology. It, it's, it's, it, it's always there for the students. So they have a record of, you know, hey, this is what happened on this day. And one of the frustrating things about a lot of these learning management systems is that there's multiple pretty good ways to organize your stuff for students. So I just like, I like that announcement uh, thing. Yeah. And uh, Bride, you're saying we can't, we can't in your district require kids to have cameras on me neither. Um, we, we cannot require to have cameras on. So um, I, I know that I've got language on one of these slides saying, uh, uh, it's, yeah, distracting. Basically, my students know that I'm not going to require them to turn their video on, but I'm also going to regularly ask because it's really nice to see them. Okay. And I'm, I'm never doing it in like a, you, you do it now method because I don't want to offend or embarrass a student because it hurts my credibility. Also, it's just, you know, <laughs> none of us want to offend and embarrass students. So I, I can't require the camera on. Um, some turn on Zoom, cameras off, and are ghosting class. Those are the ones I emailed to encourage to participate in daily. Yeah, I've got some ghosters. <laughs> I've got some ghosters. I got, yeah, you got a couple classes when no one has cameras on. Um, and, and I could, I'm going to put your, your question as, as one that we'll touch later because I is in a school that's been remote the whole school year. And so when you're that far established now and, and you've got classes where no one turns video on, now you have a norm of which which is probably system wide, you know, it's not just the ICA thing, but now you have a norm of we don't turn videos on and it'd be weird if I did. So I'm gonna point to a really good resource for that. I could want to answer your question later. Um you know, uh, no, I I'm not gonna be able to find it if I try it right now. All right, cool. Oh, I, I I love what I'm seeing in the chat. Check out the chat if you're uh here or after the fact, but I got I better keep whipping. Make sure to put your questions in the question spot on this platform if you want to make sure that I see them. Okay. <clears throat> okay, misbehaviors. So here's the deal. I told this story in a blog post yesterday, but I, I did have a student who was doing this thing where he was flashing his video on and off with with a no, with a peer. All right. They're doing the flash on and off thing. And that's a really smart misbehavior in Zoom because you can't mute a student's video unless their video is on in Zoom. And when they just flash on for like one second and, you know, make a face, you can never <laughs> catch it and mute it. So all you can really do in that situation is do what I did, which is I said, Hey, so-and-so, I need both of you to either put your video on or off, but it's distracting what you're doing right now. Please stop. And one of the students responded with profanity and basically said, I'm not turning my video on. Okay, well, as soon as you use profanity towards a person, that's that's like one of the few things I'll send you out of class for. Sending kids out of class is really easy. <laughs> uh, you just click a couple buttons and they, you know they're gone. All right, but obviously, as soon as class is over, I'm, I'm concerned about this because it's not a great start. This is the first day of Zoom. Not good. Okay, I don't want this for that student. I don't want, like, I, I don't feel, you know, well, well good. That, that kid's out of there. Um, I, I'm concerned. This is not a good first day. Um, so so the, there's a couple basic things that, that I'm doing. First of all, I don't, I don't ever want to see misbehavior distracting misbehavior that's distracting other people potentially i don't ever want to see that and not do anything about it okay um if i've said that this is going to be normal for our class then i just need to have robotic consistency and reinforcing it and now that may end up driving me insane because i've picked something that's not worth uh you know it's not a hill worth dying on 
And I, so I may need to adjust down the road, but if I want it to be a norm, then I'm in charge of reinforcing it, me. That's no one else's job. I'm that guy. So, so I, I addressed it there with the students and, and we had this outburst, all right? The student who didn't have the outburst, outburst but was engaging in the misbehavior, during the independent work portion of the class period, I went into his independent Zoom room and I said, hey, so-and-so, I just want you to know that that, that that thing that you were doing, do you get why that's distracting for other people? Okay, yeah. And hey, could you say to other student, I know, I know you guys are, are buddies, just tell them, I hope to see him tomorrow. I hope to see him tomorrow. Tell him no hard feelings. I want to see him back in class. Okay, okay, I will, Mr. Stewart. All right, so, so I've basically sought to reinforce the norm and repair the relationship if there's need for repair with that student who didn't get kicked out of class. Now, the student who did get, get kicked out of class didn't come to class the next day. And so the third day, I'm thinking, I really hope this guy shows up. Otherwise, I'm calling home. I'm going to try to connect that way. Um, he, he did show up. As soon as I had the opportunity, as soon as we were into the independent work portion of the lesson and they're in independent Zoom rooms, I pop straight to his Zoom room and I say, hey, I just want you to know it's not hard feelings here. OK, you understand why I had to, you know, send you out of class. Yeah, I shouldn't have said, OK, all right, good. Um, and then we just started to talk about video games or something, because with this particular student, I'm working what what uh, I'm working, what's called a two by ten. So if you Google two X ten, you'll see a bunch of articles. Well, I guess you should you should say two by ten teaching or two by ten classroom management. You see a bunch of articles about that strategy, really basic strategy for um, improving things with your most, the student you're most concerned about in the class. Anyways, that's how I handled it. So good, bad, otherwise, we ended on the third day of class with there not being any harm between our relationship, which is always on us as teachers first. Like we're the ones who need to work through this stuff in us and not take these things personally. One of the most important ways to not take something personally is to tell yourself it's not personal. People really don't um, often think about us as much as we think about us. So uh, yeah, that, that's, that's that. That's how I handled the misbehavior. So I would just encourage you, if you've got students who are kind of pushing your buttons, driving you crazy, um, miss, behaving, these types of things, um, process first what that's doing inside of you. That, that is the number one place to start and then begin to act in ways that are uh, moving towards that student, but firm. The culturally relevant pedagogy literature calls this a warm, authorita warmly authoritative warmly authoritative approach to teaching it. It, it, uh, it works. That's also language from the parenting literature. Okay. All right. What's, what's popping so far? Let, let's get some, let's get some audience interaction. We're doing good on time. What's, what's popping? What's standing out to you? What are you, what are you resonating with? Give me some, uh, give me some indication of what you're thinking about right now. I'm seeing a lot of people with the video off problem. Okay, while you are telling me what you're taking away, I'm gonna pull up. I'm gonna pull up something that I think you will appreciate. All right, this is an article that came out recently. It's like 20 different ideas for getting students to turn their video on. I did not write it. Um, but I had thought about maybe two of these ideas <laughs> already. So, so the article really helped me. Yeah, persuading reluctant students to turn on their cameras. So this is just going to kind of be a smorgasbord. It's from Edutopia. Um, you know, I, I don't always swear by the content on Edutopia, but but I, I found this to be a generative article for me. Okay, so there it is in the chat, and let me just throw it in the slides in case you're watching, um, in case you're listening later and wanna wanna find this. 
Okay. All right. I'm about to check what you all are saying in the chat, but um, yeah, there's, there's that link now it's in the slides. Yeah. I could check the article out. I, 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 I was intrigued by it. Listen, folks, when if you are in that situation where you've been doing this from the beginning of the year and you've got like a bunch of totally blank Zoom screens, one of the things, too, is just to realize like this is brutal and all we're responsible for in brutal teaching circumstances is trying something, trying something each day, um, doing the inner work, doing the teaching work where we are attempting to communicate about this differently. Also, I love if, when I'm facing impossible circumstances to boil down what would the tiniest possible move in the right direction look like. So that would be, you know, like getting a student to show, um, you know, a picture of their of their art or something if, if I'm an art teacher while I'm one-on-one -on -one with them in Zoom, something like that. Um, I remember Doug Fisher too. He had a comment in a session that I went to a number of months ago where he said a lot of students are, they, they don't like seeing themselves on camera. So his advice was teach them how to hide self view. I've also heard that really helps with stress. Like, like um, I've, I've heard that makes a day on zoom a lot less stressful when you don't see yourself there all the time. So might be something to, to try out for you too. People can see you, but you can't see you. And I can see where that would help. Uh, great. So Beth is saying we're going to pilot our remote learning plan with students coming up in December. How many I prepare my teachers I work with for this? So um, Beth, I, I would say the, the biggest thing I would say to your teachers, first of all, consider sending them a link to this. Um, session because the the comments about instructional model I think will be really helpful. Your teachers just have to think about how does what how does what I currently do how could that possibly shift to remote learning? And then now that you've answered that question, okay, how could I do like how, how could I start doing some of those things I'm going to have to do during remote learning? in person how can i make in person look a little more like that but with some of the goodies that in person gives you like for example you get to see all of their all of their at least i guess their eyeballs you you want them to not wait until they're piloting the remote program to start doing the remote type instructional experiments nice Cool. I love the conversation people are having with each other. Yeah, and I got, I missed I missed bookmarking your question about having students have all their cameras on, but um, but, but there we go. That's good. I'll just answer this one too. This is about instruction. James is asking any ideas how to slow down cheating when kids take tests online. I say slow down because it seems impossible to completely stop it. I'm an AP world teacher just like you. I'm trying to give tests that are true to what the AP test will look like. Yeah, Zach loves your question, James, and so do I. It's a great question. I, you're wise to say slow down because uh, we're not omnipotent. There is almost always a way to cheat if you really, 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 really want to cheat. My goal as a teacher is twofold. One, I want to take away any needless temptations that I can. So I do want to think about cheating and think about how to make it less of a difficulty for you to not cheat. I want to think about that. Um, two, though, I want to talk to you about what cheating does to a person's character. What cheating, um, the, the types of habits that cheating creates. I, so I want to be talking to you and these are just really brief little touches. Um, but but I, I want to sprinkle throughout my class, like we don't cheat because we don't cheat. We, we don't do that because we're about mastering world history, not just getting this perfect grade. If we master world history and attend to this with increasing skill throughout the year, the grade will follow and we'll enjoy ourselves a lot more. So this is the type of way I'm talking about cheating, James, while I'm with my students in class. But, you know, you, you mentioned AP. I think College Board had some good ideas for minimizing cheating. Some of these are possible at the teacher level. Some aren't. 
one really good idea they had is giving like 30 different versions of the test. That's not possible for me or for you. Don't even try it. Another good idea that they had is using a time limit that made it so that uh, if you're going to cheat, it's going to be hard to do and still answer all the question. So, you know, time limits are difficult, especially in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, especially in uh, team talk classes where a lot of students have accommodations like like one of the classes that I teach in. So so you just have to weigh out all your different constraints. But um, then, of course, too, we can try to ask questions that aren't easily Googleable. So I do like having on tests some basic knowledge questions as like a warm up on the test, kind of like the U.S. citizenship test is structured. I like putting some of those at the start of a test, no matter what subject I'm teaching, because it, it's it's important for students to know things and questions like that just tell you if they know things. But those types of questions, just basic recall questions, are super easy to Google. So cheating online is going to be way easier there. So I don't plan to use questions like that while we are remote. Ooh, Joel. Joel has put in the chat um, a bunch, uh, an article about cyber cheating. I'm going to throw this in the slideshow. So folks watching or, or listening after the fact, you can, you can see a couple of links here in the middle of the slideshow. Carmen Sita saying cheating is a short game. Yeah, that's a nice, see that language that Carmen Sita is using is so important. We want to give our students little shorthand ways um, to just like, you know, be destabilized and being okay with, with cheating. We want to destabilize that worldview because we believe it's a harmful worldview and it is, it's not good. Um, cheating is a short game. It's great language. Hey James, thanks for that question. Uh, th this is another instructional one. So I'll just take it. Zach says students working together beyond discussion. What kinds of tasks are optimal for collaboration? What format? Live sessions, async via things like Google Docs, how often? So Zach, I realized when I saw your question before the session, I'm doing almost none of that. That's directed by me, okay? Why? Um, why? Okay, so, so I think one of the reasons is because it's an added set of variables that I don't wish to place on my students at this time when they have so many added sets of variables. Instead, I talk to them about ways that they can collaborate effectively, like for example, studying with a group. And we might even do a little self-quizzing session with a small group tomorrow during one of our warm-ups to get ready for a test. And I'll say, this is the kind of thing that you can do with your classmates when you're not in school but I don't do a ton of collaborative work right now. It's just not closely aligned with my Everest and it's not right inside of that really narrow way that I try to focus. So I'm not the guy to ask and I apologize and I love your question, Zach, all your questions. So don't give up on me, ask more good questions. All right, cool. We're gonna move to motivation. Uh, student motivation. This is the secret sauce. If there's a secret sauce to what I do, it's this. And I try as much as I can to not make it a secret at all because it's really good stuff. All right. So if you've been around for a hot second, then you know that I am big on student motivation. It's the first of the six things that I examine in the book these six things. And I believe it's why my really low fluff, zero flash approach to curriculum and instruction works. This is the number one reason that what I do works um, is because <coughs> it, it's, it's because if there's anything that I'm best at in teaching, it's creating the conditions 
where motivation isn't such a bother. And I still have tons of demotivated students. I still myself struggle with demotivation every day, but I'm always thinking about these five key beliefs and how to frame assignments and exercises and units, um, how to converse with students in ways that cultivate these things, all right? I've said many times, if we don't get students to do stuff and do it with care, then we can design the best lesson in the world and it will produce next to nothing. Students ultimately have to do the work of learning in order to learn. That is just how the human mind works. You can't passively learn things. You've got to think, you've got to ask, you've got to read, you've got to uh, look up. So since we want our classrooms to contribute to long-term flourishing via mastery of whatever discipline we're tasked with teaching, then we have to figure out how to get more of our students to do work with care, okay? And of course, the work that we ask them to do is really important. Busy work doesn't help much, no matter how careful you are with it. And uh, we, we don't just wanna be pushing effort, effort, effort. So most of the language and talk and education about getting kids to do stuff and do it with care is about engagement. Engagement is important. I think engagement is worthy of study so long as you're clear about what engagement is because a lot of times it's just one of those catch-all buzzwords. It doesn't need to be though. The during task state in which a human being becomes fully immersed in a given task is engagement. It's a during task condition. Engagement doesn't bring you to Zoom class Engagement is what makes you kind of lose yourself while you're watching an asynchronous video or having a pop-up debate or whatever. That's engagement. It's a during task thing. I will just tell you that the, if you Google the four pillars of engage, engagement, um, that's, that's the best model that I've seen for thinking about engagement. But we're not going to really go into that tonight. We're going to talk about motivation. So motivation is the internal state, the internal condition within which a person genuinely desires to do a given thing with care. They're not mustering up um, a, a ton when they're motivated to do something. When they're motivated to do something in a way that I'm talking about internally, intrinsically, then work kind of comes uh, the, the energy for work, the, the power for work comes from within. And motivation, I argue, comes from what students believe. What they believe about a given task or class or situation. And as soon as, soon as my students shifted to remote learning, um, their, their beliefs were liable to shift too. Okay, because the context changed. So these five key beliefs are heavily influenceable by context. It's not abnormal for researchers to find that a student can be highly motivated in their math class first hour and highly demotivated in their social studies class in second hour. Something has changed with what they believe about learning, about the work of learning. It could be the teacher's credibility is different for the student. It could be that the student really values math because of one of a million reasons, and they think that social studies is dumb and boring. It could be because all their friends are into math and none of their friends are into social studies. That's belonging. It could be because in math, their hard work tends to pay off, and in social studies, their hard work never does. Or it could be that in math, they have a string of successes behind them that are right there in their memory. And in social studies, all they've done is fail. The context is different. So as soon as my students shifted to remote learning, their context changed. That's the most important thing that I'm thinking about when I'm working with my students remotely. How has the context changed and how do I help to mitigate negative effects of that and exponentiate the positive effects of that. Okay, so I, I've written so much and thought so much about these beliefs. I don't wanna get into crazy theory land right now, but, but I will say this. So I was talking to uh, my friend John 
a couple of weeks ago about this little spectrum here on the screen. So if you if you look up spectrum of human motivation in a given area with my name, you'll you'll find this this little uh, this image here. But basically, the five key beliefs are situated inside of a person on a spectrum. So when a kid's really motivated, they believe that their teacher's good at their job, that the work matters, and so on. And then when a child is you know, not so sure, then they're questioning or they're afraid or they don't believe. So if you blow out the ends of the spectrum, then what you've got is some students just love school. They love school, right? Well, that's what happens when you've just believed these things for a long time. You just love school. That's, on, that's, that's like when you burst through belief, that's what you get. And then some students just hate school, right? They hate school. So those ones have been in unbelief for so long that they now are in despair, which is sad. So in the, 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 the long-term play with the five key beliefs is to learn about them a little bit every day. So you can start by just reading the articles that I've written on my blog. You can take a look at the book, the course, once you spend like an hour looking up the key beliefs, though, then you get to do the really exciting thing, which is just start to think about them when you observe things happening in and out of school. Think about them when you're reading books that are about teaching and books that aren't. Think about how these beliefs shape human work and human interaction, and you're going to start to have insights into how to affect them. One of the ways that I try to affect them, we've already touched on, but I want to give you a little more about that. And it's just in the way that I talk to students about school, the way that I try to frame school. So I shared with you when creating norms with the students, I framed that as, hey, let's talk about ways to learn a lot during remote learning and enjoy life too. Let's talk about ways to do both of those things so that this doesn't feel like a grind and doesn't feel like misery and torment for us. Let's just try to, right? We've all got different challenges. And for some of us, this is bound to be hard. But let's talk about, let's at least talk about some things that'll probably help us. Today in one of my classes, I literally took my cell phone out of the room and put it outside of my door because I always tell them they should do that during learning. And I realized I'm going to do that right now. So that, that that's just like a little you know, 20 second thing that I'm doing in my class to try to have my students to value this framing of the class as a way to learn about life too. Um, and I made you some videos. So these are some videos of just me talking to students about some different things. I'm going to write blog posts about these, each one of these videos and what I'm doing in the videos, but I'm just trying to model how I talk about the five key beliefs. Okay. All right. I, I need to, I need to see how we're doing here. Okay. I love, I love all the things that y'all are sharing. Beautiful. Very good. Very good. Um, so one of the maybe most well-known strategies that I've written about for influencing a few of the beliefs really well are what I call moments of genuine connection. So this is just like my whole relationship building game. And obviously that's task one when you are starting a school year is task one during a big transition. You want to make sure that relationships are solid and that you've at least attempted to connect with all of your students. So the most efficient way to do this is through moments of genuine connection. Real basic, okay? Super good podcast that Jen Gonzalez put together where we talked about moments of genuine connection. If you Google Call to Pedagogy and Dave Stewart, you should probably find that podcast. But um, I, I mean it when I say moments. These things are brief and embedded. I'm not trying to um, create a whole extra hour of prep every day to build relationships with students. As much as possible, I want to do these in the context of the teaching that I'm doing. Um, all that I'm trying to do in an MGC is to communicate to a student that I value them, know them, and respect them. Sometimes I'm doing this personally. That was my focus in the first week of remote learning. I wanted to have a personal 
moment of genuine connection attempted with every one of my students, which comes down to five per day per class, roughly. And then sometimes it's academically. So this week, because I'm starting to see them getting a little bit lax with some of their academic work, this week, every time I connect with a student, I pop into an independent Zoom room. I, I catch a student before class, at the very end of class. Every time that I do that this week, I'm challenging myself to try to talk about something academic. So the easiest way I'm finding to do this is to just talk to them about their warm up, what I see that is strong, what I see that could use some work. I'm situating this academic feedback in language like, I'm going to give you this feedback because I respect you and I know what you're capable of and I'm glad you're here. That's a moment of genuine connection. It is an attempt though. You can't force connection with another human being. When you do that, you come off wrong. Um, but you can for sure attempt to make someone feel valued, known and respected. Of course, the genuine part is important because you need to actually value them in order to do this well. You've got to respect them to make these things more likely to work. And it's so important to track your moments of genuine connection. So I forgot my clipboard at school, but I was going to show you just the the, you know, it's got all the names of all the students that I teach. It's a single sheet. And I'm just, I've, I've even got a tally beneath the kids' names, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And I just do a tally for how many that I tried that day. But um, MGCs are almost easier now that we're remote than they were when we were in person. I really do think that they're easier because it's just so fluid for me to pop into independent Zoom rooms and attempt a quick MGC, okay? And what you're doing when you attempt to connect with a student like this is you're establishing your credibility. So you're showing them that you care about them academically and personally. You're establishing your competence. I'm able to interact with all the people in my class. You're showing that in this class, this teacher thinks that what we're doing is so important that he will attempt to connect with me. That's helping with value. Once you give feedback on student work during a moment of genuine connection, now you're going to help them with efficacy. You're going to make success a little more clear to them. And of course, it's much more easier to feel that we belong in an environment when we feel safe there. But don't miss you're trying to embed these in the work you're already doing. As much as possible, you wanna do this during the synchronous time that you're with students. And then for students who are absent, that's where, if, if I don't see them that week, that's where I'll pop a, you know, a video message to them using uh, Canvas or Moat or whatever app you're using for video with students. The easier, the better, all right? Okay, we're doing good. Let me let me see this. Are you allowed to meet with students individually via Zoom? So I am allowed to do that, Julie. I know. Knock on wood, because um, I've I've heard of plenty of places where you're not. We are allowed to do that at this time, uh, and it's not it's not recorded. So I know I do worry about that. Now we are at school. Like teachers have to report to school. Um, you know, our, our, our doors are open. So I guess that, that may be a little bit of why we've not had a hard and fast policy about that. Yeah. When I'm, when I'm feeling anxious, I, I do worry about that aspect, but you know what? I'm also just very thankful to be able to do it this way. So I'm, I'm going to, um, I'm, I'm going to probably keep doing that as long as I can. I think if we weren't allowed to meet with students remotely or one-on-one or -on -one in a Zoom breakout, then I don't know. I Yeah. Like I've heard teachers who just, ah, yeah. If anyone here live has an idea for that, let me know. But if I couldn't do the individual breakout room, I don't know. I, I don't want to interrupt the independent work time for everybody. I don't want these to be super... Um, public like like an mgc is it, it, it can definitely work when your whole class but 
you know, it's a little bit of a waste of time for everybody else. Um, and there is an attention cost. Dan is asking, how do I feel about the logic of having to report when teaching online? I get it that you have to understand that my wife stays home with our children. So I, um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, uh, yeah. And, and Crystal chooses to do that, loves to do that. So, so I don't, I don't get impacted as much by having to go into work. They, they have offered, uh, child care for, for teachers, students, but you know, there's a lot of tension with that. And I know that it's the type of thing that our administration is in conversations with our, our, um, our teaching association with, I, I'm assuming. And, uh, yeah, we'll just see how that shakes out, but I, I don't mind having to go in and you know what? It is kind of nice to see other adults, um, while I'm, while I'm teaching. And it's funny to walk through the hallways of the school and they're silent except for all these teachers sitting in their rooms talking to themselves. I, I like that. That's fun. Um, so here's a question that kind of links up with what we're going to talk about next. Zach is asking, uh, how much regular communication home is enough? And he's saying to students, to parents, to both. So Zach, stay tuned. Next Tuesday, I'm going to put out a blog post from one of our colleagues named Ed McCarthy. Ed does this really sweet end of the week uh, screencast of parents. It's not long, but I just got to imagine that this is like blowing the minds of his parents and doing a ton in terms of five key belief cultivation. So I'm considering trying that out, just like a end of the week broadcast message just to the parents of the students of the two preps that I have. Uh, if I had four preps, obviously everything's harder with the more preps that you have. So you, you got to remember if, if you're, if you're heavily multi-prepped, you need to be even more biased towards simplicity. So you might not do that. So Zach, that that's probably what, what I'll try and mess around with. I mean, you're saying how much is enough. It, it's super, um, it's, it's super, uh, you know, subjective, right? But I, I think if, if you're doing something like this guy Ed does with the end of the week screencast of parents, that's amazing. That's amazing. You're knocking out of the park. I'm way worse than that. So that'll be a push area for me. But I'm shooting right now for a moment of genuine connection with every student every week which like I said, that's five to seven per day, depending on class size. It's not too burdensome uh, at this time. I'm not finding it to be a major suck of my out of class time. And that's really important to me because out of class, I've got a lot of prep work to do and feedback on student work and that type of thing. Um, oh, Diana, your question is so good, but we're gonna save it for the teacher motivation part. Lisa, sorry I missed this question. This is about the warm up that students write and then share. Do I follow up by reading all responses at a later time or no? How do you capture the non compliant? Great question, Lisa. So, um, so that's part of why this week I'm doing a lot of my moments of genuine connection around the warm up that students have submitted. I'm hoping that this will kind of allow me to maybe catch a few. Uh, I'm not going out of my way to try to catch them, but I want to reinforce this norm, you know? So if it's rampant, if not doing the warm-up is rampant, then I want to catch that and, and really just give a student um, a tough moment of genuine connection where I have to say, hey, this isn't okay. Like, what's going on? Why aren't you doing your warm-up? That's a really important part of the lesson, and I need you to do it, and you need to do it. So what's what's happening? How can I help? That's the kind of way that I'll talk to students when I catch them not doing that. But I don't have time to read all their warm-ups after the fact. So sometimes I will, sometimes I won't, but I don't do that every day. Yeah, great question. I love it. And, and Lisa, that this links back to the reason that I don't have to do that, um, the reason that I don't feel bad about not doing that is because of how much I'm always trying to influence these five key beliefs. Okay. 
the better we can get at creating belief rich environments for our students, the less that we're going to have to make sure that they comply. Because when we do check up on them every now and then, we're going to find a lot of them are doing it. But why are they doing it? Doing it, they're doing it. Most matter. They're doing it because we've been really explicit with what a successful warm up looks like, and we've given them proper specific praise or critique when they do or don't measure up to that. These types of things make warm ups a lot more motivating. Your question's really, really good. Thanks for being so practical. Um. Okay. Okay. Cool. So Ellen's asking a, a question, how and why did your school decide to go with a compressed daily schedule? We'll be remote come Monday and are still looking at using a, a, a block A day, B day. Great question, Ellen. I wasn't a part of that uh, final decision making, but the, the big thing that our school was concerned with is families who have students in multiple buildings. And how do you create something that is intelligible to all those folks? Because as soon as we go remote whole district, um, now all of a sudden you've got multi-child families who are trying to wrap their head around all these different ways to learn. And it's, it's super frustrating. So I think that's the lens through which they decided to say, okay, we're going to do a compressed kind of regular daily schedule for all of our buildings. And it, it'll look different depending on which building, which grade level, but the, the basic concept of a normal school day, but slightly compressed will be their K-12. I think that was really important to our decision makers. Uh, okay. All right, Beth, thanks for your question. We hit that one earlier. All right. All right, cool. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk about when, when kids don't show up. Ready for a, my worst answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, I've seen people who will make screencasts for individual students when they're absent. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, six days into remote learning so far. I've done nothing. <laughs> it's so bad to say, but at this point, most kids are showing up. I want to make that experience as good as possible uh, I do have requirements in my school. If kids don't show up two days in a row, then I have to, I have to, I have to attempt to a communication and document that. Um, so, so I, I've had to do that in, in a few cases, but, but right now we're at the very beginning. So I, I have not had to think really hard about this question, but what I plan to do is to uh, reach out via messaging inside of our LMS first, brief video message um, or text message, you know, typing message. What, what I was doing when we were in person, but some students were quarantining and not showing up is I was just saying, okay, you know, I, I need to interact with you on your warm up every day, at least in order for you to be present today. And once I can get that habit established, now I can start to work on, well, why are you not showing up? What's happening? So I was having to do more of what you're asking about in this question. I was having to do more of that when we were in person than now that we're remote so far. I expect it to get worse. But the number one thing that I say about things like this is we just do what we can do. We do what we can do. So we attempt to reach out. We attempt to make the first step of coming back as, as, as easy as possible. When I find that students have ghosted me and they're there in the Zoom, but they don't respond when I call on them, then I make a note to follow up with them during the independent work time. And if they're still ghosting me, then I send a note and say, hey, if this happens again, I'll reach out to parents or guardians to try to figure out what's going on because I can't, I can't get in touch with you and I really want to. And I don't know, I hope that's not a threat. It's just me saying, I do care about you. It's important to me that you're able to be here and learn. And I get that some things are not in your control, right? Like maybe you're dealing with a sibling at that time. I just need to know so that we can figure out how to make this as good as possible for you. 
Okay, I mentioned this parent screencast thing. Take a take a look next Tuesday. Um, if you're listening to this the week before Thanksgiving 2020, next Tuesday I got a I got a post coming out featuring Ed's work. Okay, we enter we we round the bend to the final segment. Final segment. It's going to be on teacher motivation. So excited to talk to you about this because it's so important, so important. Um, Aaron, Aaron is saying, this is helpful. She's saying that when, when she has students absent, she sends an email of the recording with the slides to all absent students. So what I love about what Aaron is saying there is that she's taking something that she already has, a recording that she made while, while working with the students who attended class that day, and she's just, popping that into an email and sending it to students. That's simplicity. Now, Aaron also has a question, which I might as well answer. Since we're talking about Aaron, how are you managing your pacing? Oddly enough, I feel like everything in the virtual space somehow takes double the time. I do too. So I am just having to strip away some of the things I've done in the past that took more time, Aaron. For example, I'm sad by how few pop-up debates we've had this year. That was something that by this point in previous years we would have done. By, by this point in the year, gosh, we, we probably would have had six or seven pop-up debates. As it stands, we've had three, and they're jacked up <laughs> because like class is weird. And I haven't done one remotely yet because – Class is weird, so I'm doing flip grids while we're remote, and it's just different, and I'm doing less because I don't have as much time. I find that, uh, and the compressed schedule is part of that. All of it, all of it, all the things are making it hard. Mm. Diana's question is a perfect segue into teacher motivation. She says, Managing the expectations I put on myself to not push too much to make school resemble previous years. How do I share that realistic picture with colleagues and administration? So Diana, the number one thing that I'm finding is helping teachers to get over the morale, or I guess I should say to come up out of the despair valley. I mean, we all kind of dip down in there, you know, every few days or so or whatever, every couple of class periods. But I mean, there was a really intense ravine that many of us went through and some of us still probably feel like we slipped back into it where work felt really bad this school year. And I think the, the, the number one thing that has helped people is changing expectations and not using last year, last year's pedagogy, last year's accomplishments prior to March not using last year as the measuring st stick is really important. So the, the way that we share that with colleagues in administration, Diana, I think the best way to really get that to sink in for people is to share what you're doing in your class. What are you actually doing in your class that exemplifies how you've changed your expectations for yourself? Show them what instruction looks like. Show them what your learning management system looks like and talk about, while you're showing them, talk about how this, this, this is this way because of changes that you've had to make and what you're expecting of yourself. If you can do that um, from a thoughtful and authentic place, you're gonna find that it, that it moves people way more than a speech about changing expectations will. Great question. Okay, so when we talk about teacher motivation, the will to teach, thinking about this a lot right now, we, we gotta, I think, go deeper than self-care or at least more coherent than self-care and mindfulness. That stuff's not bad. I think it all comes from a great place, but it feels like a mishmash. It feels like all these random things that I have to do in order to not be crazy. And that makes me feel crazy. <laughs> so it just adds all this pressure to my life. So 
there are two things that we must understand and speak to, speak to to ourselves, speak to with each other. Um, two things that we must try to improve if we're going to really take care of ourselves or really be um, increasingly motivated this school year. First of all, we've got to deal with the workload problem. We all have more to do. The default for all of us is more to do. And second of all, we've got to deal with the pressure problem. Not only do we have tons of pressure from work, in part because of our increased workload, <laughs> uh, we, we also have a bunch of pressure in all these other areas of life. Okay. And as we've long talked about on the blog, that has a cost. You can only handle so much pressure before performance begins to decline. So if we don't deal with this, what ends up happening is that the pressure makes us worse at work. We're more prone to distraction. We're more prone to chasing bunny trails. We're more prone to complaining with our colleagues because we're just pressured. And so now we have more work to do that we're behind on and it becomes a really bad cycle. Okay, that's the bad news. The good news is that there are ways that we can improve both of those things, okay? So for workload, we can become students of the disciplines of simplification, focus, satisficing. Google that word in my name if you've never seen it before. Satisficing is such a beautiful concept. I've had so many people write me emails saying, the only word you've ever taught me that has changed my life, Dave Stewart, is satisfice. And I say, you can thank Herbert Simon, a 1950s economist for that word. And yes, I also think it's awesome. So those things on the left, the, the these workload things, simplification, focusing, satisficing, being okay with repetition, using repetition wisely, those all will help us with the workload problem. And in terms of pressure, we need to think about depressurization methods for our intellect, our emotion, our body, and our social life. So the, the, the key is that you, you've got to bridge these two things because if you're, if you're listening to this and you're in a bad place motivationally, you might be thinking, dude, I don't have time to do all that crap that you just said. That's where placing constraints around your work comes in. The number one thing that you've got to do if you're going to start to make headway motivationally is you've got to place some limits on work. So that's where you talk with your, your loved one, your, your friend, your mentor, and you say, I need a change. What in the world do I do? I've got to, I've got to just, I've got to, I've got to just have ways. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, ways to make work stay in, in its boxes. So maybe that's you working 70 hours a week because that's better than 80. The ideal would be 50 at most 60 hours a week. And so just calculate where, where do you want those things to be worked in your week? And what constraints help you to do, what fixed schedule productivity helps you, helps you to do that's what Cal Newport calls it, fixed schedule productivity, is it forces you to do this stuff with workload. It's going to force you to have to simplify, focus, satisfy, repeat, reduce. It's going to force you to do that because you don't have enough time to do everything that you want, everything that you think you have to do. Uh, to go back to Zach's question, it's going to force you to define what enough is because enough has to be what I can, what I can do. It can't be more than that. And it's also going to give you time and space to do these depressurization things. So this deserves a whole, um, th th this deserves a deep dive. So, Hey, announcement. I'm pretty sure I'm making a course on the will to teach. I'm going to make an online PD on the will to teach it's going to be um, designed for people to experience in little little dabs of goodness, two to ten minute videos with reflective application exercises. If you've done my other courses, this will be most like the student motivation course. 
but it will be about teacher motivation. And I think it'll be called the will to teach. So if you go to this link, davestewartjr.com slash WTT, you can sign up for the wait list. I think I'm probably going to release it on January 1st, 2021, because not much good has happened in 2020. I just don't want to start a course in 2020. So I'm excited about this. I'm excited about this because I'm, I, I think for a number of years I've wanted to make a learning experience like this, but I didn't have the the knowledge, the framework, the research chops to really do it justice. I think I'm there, thanks in part to 2020. So if we if we make this really practical and not you know some tantalizing tease about a course, um, then what I would say is just start to think about self-care a little bit more robustly and think about it as how am I depressurizing and how am I reducing workload? Okay. It'll help. It'll be nice. And now let's talk about boundaries because I've been hearing a lot about boundaries lately. When we shift to remote learning, we've had some conversations as a staff about boundaries that I've participated in and I really appreciate them and love them. I think it's good. Boundaries are really what this bridge is. It's that's that's about boundaries. Okay, but the problem is a lot of us build kind of wimpy sandcastle boundaries. Wimpy sandcastle boundaries. I'm not making fun of you if you make these. I'm just saying we've got to do better than these because they don't function correctly. So, you know, I've heard people say, one boundary that I have is I tell parents that I only check my email at these hours each day. Okay. That's wimpy. It's a sandcastle boundary. It's a sandcastle boundary because one, all that you've done, if, if, if that's all you've done, you've just put out there another expectation on yourself that's going to produce pressure on yourself. You've made this kind of promise that complicates your life. Um, you, you've now kind of given parents a sense of when when exactly in the day they can expect to hear from you. Uh, and and I don't know, like I'm not, I'm not saying this is bad, but I'm saying it's really easy to cheat at this. It's really easy to pull out your phone or open up your laptop tonight when you're, you know, got the kids in bed and pull up your email. And now you've washed away that boundary because you're not actually checking your email when you said you would. <laughs> That's what I mean by sandcastle boundary. They're so easy to break. So instead you go back to the blog post I wrote a couple weeks ago and you say like, okay, email is now going to be like a, like a physical mailbox for me. I'm only checking that thing one to two times per day. When I do check it, I don't want stacks of mail. I want to do something with the mail. I only handle it once. Ohio, my email. And so this means that I might have to make some quicker decisions. This means I might have to have my calendar open in a tab when I'm checking email because uh, my most, <laughs> the, the emails that always make me procrastinate the most are ones about scheduling. So I might have to have my calendar out. Um, and I'm for sure going to have to delete email the heck off of my smartphone and, you know, maybe maybe do a Chrome extension so that I can't access email during certain days on my Google Chrome. Um, I don't spend much time on my laptop at home, so it's not really a temptation on my laptop too much. It's it's deleting email off the smartphone. That was a that was a Himalayan boundary for me. So good to do that. OK. I'm just making sure our time's good. Yeah. Yeah, Carmen Cita. Little, little dabs of goodness. Um, really cool, really cool, really cool. Uh, so, th so that's a thing that I want you to think about. That's something that's been helping me is Himalaya boundaries. I ain't talking to you about them. I'm making them reality in my life. And you will know implicitly you will figure out that Dave Stewart doesn't respond to emails at night because he just never will. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that I don't respond to emails at night. You don't really need to know that. You'll figure it out. You'll realize, wow, emails don't come back at night from this guy. 
but they tend to come back the next day. Okay. And that's good. And when they do come back, he treats me like a person. He takes my concerns seriously. So that's good. And you're not going to have a problem with me emailing you the next day. You won't have a problem because we'll, we'll be okay. We'll be okay. I'll take you seriously. All right. I'll take you seriously, but it won't be at night. All right. Now urge surfing. This is, I think this is my last thing. This, this is cool. I came across this in the self-control research um, or maybe it was mindfulness research, but, but this is a cool concept that I, I thought sounded really dumb, but then I tried it and liked it. So urge surfing is about observing when you have a compulsive urge. So it might be around eating or it might be around like, um, you know, looking something up on your smartphone, like the news or social media or whatever, or, or, uh, what happens to me a lot is I'm trying to write a blog post and I'm annoyed that I can't think and all of a sudden the urge pops up. Maybe you could just check the news. Maybe you could just uh, go to YouTube and see if, you know, that those AP world history teachers have made a new video that you could use tomorrow in class. Maybe you could just, maybe you could just. Urge surfing is trying to back away when you see yourself getting an urge to do something that you don't want to do and going through a couple of things. So first of all, what just triggered that? What happened inside of me that made me want to open up a new tab and go do something that I'm not trying to do right now? What triggered that? And you're just observing it. And now you're going to watch. Now you're going to like watch this, this urge go up. So now when you start to really want to click that button or, you know, shove 38 peanut M&Ms in your mouth, now you're just like watching how that, oh, that, that desire is not going away. It's really there. You're going to watch it as it peaks. You're going to be like, okay, okay, this is intense. I really want, I'm really curious what's on, you know, uh, uh, you know, Twitter. I'm really curious to see if one other person <laughs> says something to me on Twitter. I really want to check it. And then you're going to observe as it falls away. And as you're able to look back at what you're working on, and go back to it. So um, I find that this works best when it's like uh, um, when when you're when you're doing something that is not super cognitive because you need some cognitive space to be able to observe. So, like for example, when I'm with my kids trying to play with them, and I want to all of a sudden go like look up something on the internet. That's when I'm really finding urge surfing to be very cool because I'm just noticing how like the types of things that trigger me to want to distract myself are, are things really that make me feel uncomfortable. And a lot of times it's just like maybe a memory from work last week. And I'm like, ah, I don't know what to do about that. And it just instantly triggers me to, to want to go like just get something new in my mind, like, like the news or check this website or that website or this, this channel, um, go to those places where I can just get a little novelty, which is uh, a way of, I think, escaping from those triggering things. So I just, I, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't talked about urge surfing with my students yet, but I think that I will because I do talk to them about the importance of finding ways to make distraction less of a driving force in our life. And this seems like it would help. Okay. That was 10 or so things right there. My friends, my colleagues, that was 10 or so things. So now we're going to, now we're going to drop it to a couple more questions. I want to know in chat, all you Pacific time zoners, you're still here. Uh, you know, I think I think uh, my friend Brad in the in Cambodia, he's he's probably starting to teach class right now. But a lot of you're still here. Put in the chat what's most important to you. We've looked at so many things. I told you at the beginning of this session, this might be overwhelming, so don't be afraid to pause and come back next time. What's most important to you? What do you want to do next to move you forward? All right. 
Yes, Aaron Hill. Represent for the Eastern. Beth. Ah, uh, oh, Beth, I love this. She last minute canceled a not important weekly check-in meeting with her principal this morning because she needed to sleep. And she was proud of herself for taking this stand. Yeah, Beth just demonstrated to herself, I'm the kind of person who will choose sleep over work sometimes. That's key. That's key. So a, another Himalayan boundary that I have to try to protect sleep is, except when I'm, you know, webinaring with my friends, I don't, I don't want to be on this thing at night after like the kids are in bed. I just don't want to be on it. There are so many doggone books behind me that I've never read. <laughs> so many, so many. I want to read those. I want to look through those. I want to have a conversation with my wife. I want to um, do the dishes and look out the window. Like I, I want to, so, so that I don't have to face the dishes tomorrow. I want to do non-tech things from like eight o'clock until nine, nine thirty. Want to be in bed at nine thirty, reading in bed, and then asleep by ten o'clock. Those are so. So those that kind of hard and fast rule that devices are away in our house after after the kids go to bed. That is a Himalaya, more of a Himalaya kind of boundary. I guess the real Himalaya boundary would be like to put my laptop in a Ziploc bag and put it in the, the toilet tank. That'd be a little more Himalaya, but I'm not there yet. Not there yet. Don't think I'm going to be actually. That seems like very risky activity. Let's see what else is coming in here. Um, Carmen Cita wants to Ohio and block her upcoming plans. Clear boundaries of work. Barb, love it. Much love to you and Ica there in Washington. Use repetitive blocks. A weekly video update. Yeah, Laura. Laura, if you want to see Ed Mc Mc McCarthy's thing sooner, just email me. Dave at DaveStewartJr.com. I'll send you his video right away if you want to excuse me, see an example of it. It's, it's really cool. As soon as he sent it to me, I was like, dude, can I please put this on the blog soon? Cause you, you kind of got it going on here. This is pretty simple, but I suspect pretty powerful. Um, Jane, you just started remote. So yeah, Jane, I would say for you with having that in person, you're, you're right on the money. You want to make sure that you hit an MGC with every child each week, if at all possible. That will just bridge you right over. Uh, yeah, Diana, in a non-pandemic world, I didn't bring my laptop charger home. That's what I'm talking about. That's a Himalayan boundary because she's going to have to go back to work or go to Best Buy or something. The Best Buy still exists in order to get a laptop charge. So she can only be on her laptop so long before she runs out of it at home. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, obviously now the, the boundary thing is, it, it's it's an important question. That's why I say I love that our principal brought it up because it becomes sticky when you're doing all this stuff from home. Okay, Matt's, oh, Laura. Laura once went to the neighbors to get a laptop charger when she did that, that thing that Diana did. That's money. Hey, people climb the Himalayas, right? They're not. They're not impossible to climb. Uh, Matt, did did you ever, Matt asked in the conversation about teaching the politics, did you ever offer policy perspectives anonymously rather than attributed to one of the candidates or were they always identified? Matt, I love that question. That would have been so good to do. I did not do that. Um, like I said, my class is not a current events class. I'm just trying to use current events as, a, as an ongoing theme for helping my students to value world history. I want them to um, know a little bit about what's happening in the world now. Also, of course, I'm indebted to Kelly Gallagher, whose article of the week assignment is just like a low time investment way to give children a lot more opportunities to learn stuff about the world. So, um, but no, I, I think that would be really cool. That would be really cool to depersonalize politics because that's really what the with the three languages of politics book, the, the Arnold Kling book is so helps you to do is to humanize people 
who think about politics really differently from you. And, you know, I don't know, can I use those words together? Humanize and depersonalize. We just, we want to be able to have arguments. If in order to have an earnest and amicable argument, you got to take the issue and put it right here. And you've got to try to see the ways that your, that your naysayer might look at that so that you can more deeply understand your position. And maybe you're going to have to change your position. But with these candidates in this presidential election, there's so much personal enmeshment between the candidates and the people. You know, so much of this was about, I, I don't know, it, it was intense. So I like, I like what you're getting at there, Matt. I think that that could have been a really good technique. Oh my gosh, Shana, I've got to answer your question. It's on my slides. But Shana has another one here. How do we bring units to a satisfying end? Okay, this is the question. How do we bring units to a satisfying end in this very strange remote world? I want to have those great debates and discussions to seal off our learning experience with a text in a cohesive big group way. I'm missing the cathartic nature. That's the right word of big group discussion, letting a text breathe in the classroom. Oh, Shana, you had to ask such a good question. Well, I haven't ended a unit yet remotely, so I don't know. I know that in the past, a, a pop-up debate followed by essay writing or essay writing preceding a pop-up debate used to be such a fun way to end a unit around a text, such a cool way to have a true capstone enclosure. As I said, I'm going to be trying to do this pop-up debate thing through Flipgrid just because of how many of my students are not wanting to show video during Zoom. You know, like, because because here's the thing in pop-up debate, like rule one is when you talk, you've got to stand up and everyone has to talk at least once. There's no opt-out in pop-up debate. And that's part of what makes it so cathartic in whole class. Such an important piece of my my whole pedagogy is this really scary thing that I ask and teach students to do regularly throughout the school year. Well, that, that really kind of is, is removed with remote because it's like if, if I don't have to turn my video on, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like I'm in the pop-up debate, but I'm invisible type of thing. So it just – and then you've got kids ghosting and stuff. So I just don't know how to do it. I, I know that I don't want to require video. I can't. So I just – I'm doing the flip grid thing. Um, none of my students yet have asked if they can have their video off for that. So I'm sure that'll happen and we'll just have to cross that bridge when it comes, but it won't be the same. Shana it won't be the same. Ooh, Carmen Cita though. She's got an idea. Try breakout rooms, do a Socratic seminar. I like it. Hey everybody. I, I, uh, I, I really wanted to take a picture of this setup that one of my colleagues has, uh, Chris Painter. He's, um, He's the math teacher that, that teaches across the hall from me. This guy has got two laptops, and one of them's hooked up to this like big old monitor that he commandeered from the from the video teacher. <laughs> He's literally got three screens. Uh, one of the laptops is on Zoom, the other one's on the same Zoom. So this guy is able to well, and he's big on group work and collaborative work. So he so he's able to monitor two groups at a time on zoom you can kind of listen in and you know i mean he's he's incredible at, at collaboration zach he's the guy who you should come watch if, if you want to see what collaboration can look like productively remotely he's the guy um and he always makes fun of me because i'm so bad at what he's so good at but we we love each other it's okay we can make fun of each other that's fine Um, we, we have about a minute left. So I, oh, Kakai, students use stickers to cover their face on Flipgrid. Don't tell me that. Your students aren't allowed to talk to mine. Okay. Not until this is over. Um, it, with, with my last 50 seconds before this program cuts me off, I just want to say thank you. 
Uh, Jane, I will ask Chris Painter to make a video. He'll probably give me a lot of crap for that, but I'll blame it on you. Um, I want to say thank you, everybody. Thank you for those who came live. Thank you for those who are watching the replay or listening to the replay. I need you to know that we are in such a partnership, you and me. The, the things that I do and make for teachers aren't possible without your incredible intellect and heart for this work. I'm not going to be motivated to do the things that I do. Um, I'm not going to be capable to do the things that I do without uh, your collegiality. So I send you so much love and appreciation, and I hope that you have a really good night.